Okay, so everything that we've been learning so far in my previous videos on Chapter 8's coverage of substitution and on Chapter 9's coverage of elimination up to this point has been leading us to this destination. We now have the ability to determine if any given substitution or elimination reaction will proceed through an SN1, SN2, E1, or E2 mechanism. And in fact, that is the question that we're going to answer together for the ensuing examples. Predict the products of the following reactions and identify them as SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. Let's start with this first one. Remember that when we look at the starting material and the given reactants, we're going to go through the series of questions I presented in the previous lecture. First thing, we look at our starting material and determine if the carbon stuck to our leaving group, in this case a bromine, is primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized. Remember that if it's primary, then the only reaction it can proceed through is either E2 or SN2. If it's tertiary, then it could potentially proceed through either E1, SN1, or E2. And if it's secondary or stabilized, it could potentially be any of the above. You'll notice that if this bromide leaves, giving me a carbocation at that position, not only is it a secondary carbocation, but it's a stabilized secondary carbocation because it's at the benzyl position, meaning that it can resonance to localize through this ring. Thus, by asking question number one, is my carbon stuck to my leaving group primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized? I have determined that it is indeed stabilized, which means it could be any of the above reactions, SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. That takes me to the next question. Is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? Notice that we have potassium stuck to hydroxide. Anytime we see a group one metal stuck to another atom, we can, in our minds, pretend that that group one metal is really a negative charge. Thus, when this is thrown into solution, this will effectively behave as a hydroxide ion. You'll notice that that negative charge is localized to that oxygen, and thus it is strong. Remember that strong nucleophile slash bases proceed through E2 or SN2 mechanisms. The reason is because they're so reactive, they will not wait around long enough for a leaving group to take off and give me a carbocation intermediate. That process just takes too long they will instead start reacting immediately. So to this point, we know that this reaction will proceed either by an SN2 or an E2 mechanism. That takes us to question number three. Is my nucleophile slash base a nucleophile or is it a base? Now remember what I told you in our previous lecture. If this nucleophile slash base, in this case hydroxide, looks smaller than ethanol when I draw it on paper, it will behave more like a nucleophile than a base in a substitution elimination scenario. The exceptions, of course, are acetate or nucleophile slash bases that have sulfur in them, which will behave as nucleophiles even if they're larger than ethanol on paper. Is hydroxide smaller or larger than ethanol when I draw it on paper? It's, of course, smaller, which means that it will behave as a nucleophile and therefore will favor an S reaction. Thus, this will favor an SN2 pathway. The mechanism, of course, is that this hydroxide will come in, form a bond with this carbon, kicking off the bromide in a single step, and give me this product. There will, of course, be an inversion of stereochemistry. However, because all of these lines are drawn flat in this starting material, it implies that I have a racemic mixture at this stereocenter of both enantiomers. Thus, I will get both enantiomers in a 50-50 racemic mixture in my product. Let's take a look at this example. It's the same one, of course, so we go through question number one. Is it primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized? And we realize that it's a secondary stabilized, thus it could proceed potentially through any of the above reaction mechanisms. The next question is this. Is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? You'll notice that this nucleophile slash base methanol has no localized negative charges. What it does have is lone pair electrons, that is a partial charge due to polarity on the oxygen. Thus, it is a weak nucleophile slash base. That means that this reaction will proceed either through an E1 or an SN1 mechanism. But which of the two will it be? Well, that takes me to question number three. Is my nucleophile slash base a nucleophile or base? The way I determine this is by asking myself, is this molecule smaller or larger than ethanol when I draw it on paper? 
It is, of course, smaller, which means that it will react more as a nucleophile than as a base. Thus, this will proceed through an SN1 mechanism. Of course, that mechanism proceeds as follows. The bromide leaves, giving me a carbocation intermediate. The lone pairs on the oxygen come in, giving me a temporary positively charged oxygen intermediate until it gets deprotonated by a second molecule of methanol to give me this product. If there were any stereochemistry in the starting material, that is, if I'd specifically drawn a wedge or a dash to this bromine, it would be lost in the product, giving a mixture of both enantiomers. So let's do the same for this example. Is my leaving group, this chlorine, stuck to a primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized carbon? It's, of course, a secondary, which means this could potentially be an E1, E2, SN1, or SN2 mechanism. Is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? Localized negative charge on this oxygen means that it is strong. Thus, it will proceed through a 2 reaction, in this case, either E2 or SN2. Next question, is my nucleophile slash base a nucleophile or a base? It's smaller than ethanol on paper, which means that it's a nuke, which means that this will favor an SN2 mechanism. Of course, the hydroxide is going to come in, backside attack, kick off the chloride in a single step, and give me this product. You'll note that we have an inversion of stereochemistry. In this example, we go through the same three questions. Is my leaving group, this tosylate group, stuck to a primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized carbon? It is, of course, secondary, which means that it could be any of the above. Next question, is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? It's, of course, water, which has no localized negative charges. Thus, it is weak. That means that it's going to proceed through an, either an SN1 or E1 reaction mechanism. Last question, is my nucleophile slash base a nucleophile or a base? That's, of course, based all on size. Is H2O smaller or larger than ethanol when I draw it on paper? It's smaller, which means that it's going to be a nuke, which means that this will proceed through an SN1 mechanism. This tosylate takes off, giving me a carbocation intermediate. You'll note, of course, that a hydride shift will occur with the hydrogen at this position moving over to plug that hole, giving me a more stable tertiary carbocation intermediate. The water nucleophile then comes in, oxygen first, gets deprotonated later to give me this product. You'll note, of course, that any stereochemistry present in the starting material is completely lost, as this nucleophile can attack the carbocation at this position for both the front and the back in a 50-50 mixture. This position is, of course, not a stereocenter, thus I can't say that this is a racemic mixture. But if it were, it would give me a mixture of both enantiomers. Let's move on to this example. Is my leaving group stuck to a primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized carbocation? It is, of course, secondary. That means it could be SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. Next question, is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? There are no localized negative charges of any kind, thus it is weak, which means I can round it down to SN1 or E1. Last question, is my nucleophile slash base a nucleophile or a base? It is larger than ethanol when I draw it on paper. Thus, it is a base, which means that it will favor an E reaction, so this will proceed by an E1 mechanism. The bromide takes off, giving me a secondary carbocation. There's, of course, a 1-2 hydride shift, giving me the more stable carbocation at the tertiary position. And then this base can come in and grab a hydrogen, either at this position, plugging the hole by thrusting electrons down to form a carbon-carbon double bond here, or grabbing a hydrogen at the upper carbon up here, thrusting electrons down to plug the hole, giving me a carbon-carbon double bond here. Thus, I get the mixture of these two products. Now let's look at this example. Is my leaving group stuck to a primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized carbon? Of course, it's secondary, which means it could be SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. Is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? Well, I've got a sodium here, which I can think of as being a negative charge. However, that negative charge is not a localized negative charge. It can resonance delocalize between both of these oxygens, which means it's not a strong, potent, pointy negative charge. It is, in fact, a weak negative charge. Because this is weak, it's going to proceed by either an SN1 or an E1 mechanism. The next question we have to ask is, is this thing a nucleophile or a base? Well, when we draw it on paper, it does look larger than ethanol, so I'd be tempted to say it's a base. However, this molecule is acetate, which is one of the exceptions I told you, will behave more as a nucleophile than as a base. Thus, this will proceed by an SN1 mechanism. 
My bromide takes off, giving me a secondary carbocation. There are no one-two shifts possible to improve the stability of that carbocation. Thus, no one-two shifts will occur. My nucleophile comes in, forms a bond with that carbon, and gives me this product. You'll note, of course, that because this proceeds by an SN1 mechanism, this nucleophile can, in theory, form a bond with that carbon from both the front and the back, giving me a mixture of both stereoisomers at that stereocenter. Here's another example. My leaving group, is it stuck to a primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized carbon? It's, of course, secondary, which means that it could be SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. Next question, is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? This is a lithium, which I can think of as being a negative charge, and you'll note that that negative charge does not resonance delocalized. Thus, this is strong, so it must be either SN2 or E2. Last question, is my nucleophile slash base a nuke or a base? It's larger than ethanol when I draw it on paper, and it's not acetate or a sulfide. Thus, I can say this is a base, which means it will proceed through an E reaction. It will be E2. What this means, of course, is that this base can come and either grab a hydrogen at this carbon, push the electrons down, kick off the leaving group in one fell swoop, forming a carbon-carbon double bond here, or it can grab the hydrogen at this carbon, pumping the electrons down, kicking off the iodide to form a carbon-carbon double bond here. Thus, I will get these two products. The more favored of the two will, of course, be this one right here, because it's the more substituted alkene by Zaitsev's rule. Let's look at this example. My leaving group stuck to a primary, secondary, tertiary carbon. It is, of course, stuck to a secondary carbon. That tells me it could be either SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. My nucleophile slash base, is it strong or weak? I, of course, have a localized negative charge on a carbon. Thus, it is strong, which means it's going to be either E2 or SN2. Next question, is it a nuke or a base? You'll note that when you draw this cyanide group on paper, it's smaller than ethanol. Thus, it's small enough to come in here to this carbon, do an S and 2, and form a bond there, kicking off the iodide in a single step, meaning it is going to proceed through an S and 2 mechanism. I will, of course, get this product with an inversion of stereochemistry because the cyanide nucleophile has to attack from the backside relative to where this iodine is. Okay, I hope you're having a good time so far. Let's do some more examples, looking at this one. Same exact molecule we looked at before. We note that the iodine leaving group is attached to a secondary carbon, which means it could proceed by SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. I go to my next question. Is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? It's, of course, strong. Is it a nuke or a base? It's larger than ethanol, thus it is a base. Because it's a strong base, it's, of course, going to proceed by an E2 reaction mechanism. Thus, this strong base can come in, form a bond with the hydrogen at this position, dumping the electrons down, and kicking off the iodide in one fell swoop, forming a carbon-carbon double bond to the right, or it can do the same thing at the left. Now, please note that if this base forms a carbon-carbon double bond at the position to the left, it could form two different isomers. The isomer shown here, which is the E isomer, or the isomer shown here, which is the Z isomer. In reality, both of them will form. The E isomer will, of course, be the more stable and thus the more favored isomer. If I form a carbon-carbon double bond at the terminus, however, I also get this product here. In reality, I will likely get a mixture of all of these with the one shown here at the left being the major product. All right, let's look at another example. Is my leaving group stuck to primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized carbon? It's, of course, secondary, which means it could be SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. Is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? I've got a delocalized negative charge, which means that it's weak, which implies that it's going to proceed either through SN1 or E1. Is my nucleophile slash base a nucleophile or a base? It's larger than ethanol on paper. However, this is one of the exceptions that I told you to memorize. This guy will behave more as a nucleophile. Thus, this will proceed by an SN1 mechanism. My iodide takes off, giving me a carbocation intermediate. My weak nucleophile comes in and forms a bond between this oxygen and that positively charged carbon center, giving me this product. I, of course, lose all of the stereochemistry as I proceed, giving me a mixture of both enantiomers. All right, I hope you're having fun. Here's another example. Now I've got something very, very similar, except my leaving group isn't quite as good of a leaving group. This is an OH instead of an iodine or a bromine. An OH is not quite as good, but I can still go through the same questions. Is my leaving group stuck to primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized carbon? It's, of course, secondary, which means it could be SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. Is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? Well, this is interesting because you'll note it's actually an acid. There's no localized negative charges anywhere. 
So it's going to have to be weak, which means that it's going to proceed through either an SN1 or an E1 mechanism. Is this nucleophile base a nuke or a base? Well, you notice that it's eventually going to give me an acetate nucleophile, which is one of the exceptions I told you to memorize. It is going to be a nuke. Thus, this will proceed through an SN1 mechanism. The mechanism for this one is actually a little bit interesting, and I wanted to show it to you. What occurs is we have our starting material alcohol, which is going to, of course, look over here and see our molecule, which is acetic acid. What's next going to happen is the lone pairs in this oxygen are going to reach out, form a bond with that hydrogen, pumping the electrons up onto the acetate, and giving me this intermediate. This is, of course, a positively charged oxygen. And the reason is not because it lacks a full octet, but because it's forming three bonds. At this point, that positively charged oxygen takes off as a water leaving group, which is a very good leaving group, giving me a secondary carbocation at this position. This is, of course, completely congruent with an E1 mechanism. My acetate nucleophile now comes in and forms a bond with that carbon, giving me my final product. Because this acetate can come in either from the front or the back, three-dimensionally speaking, I get a mixture of both enantiomers at this stereocenter. Whew. I hope this lecture's journey of going through this process of determining whether something will be E1, E2, SN1, or SN2 has been fruitful and enjoyable for you. In my final lecture in this chapter, I'll show you guys how to use elimination substitution reactions in synthesis, which I hope you're looking forward to with great anticipation. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.